Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us this morning for uh, Dr. Amin Kiagadi's presentation uh, titled Characterization and Modeling of Compound Flooding Events and Their Environmental Impacts. Uh, my name is Bridget Scanlon from the Bureau of Economic Geology. Um, Dr. Amin Kiagadi received his uh, PhD in Environmental Engineering from the University of Houston in 2018 and his Master's in Water Resources uh, in 2013 and bachelor's in civil engineering in 2010 from the University of Tehran. After finishing his doctoral research, uh, uh, he did a two-year postdoc uh, uh, jointly uh, between the um, Oden Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at University of Texas at Austin and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Houston under the um, Dr. Clint Dawson at UT Austin and Dr. Hanadi Rafai at uh, University of Houston. His research includes uh, geospatial modeling, machine learning for coastal resiliency, hurricane storm surge simulation, rainfall induced flooding, fate and transport of pollutants uh, in the environment, uh, water and sediment quality, and water energy nexus. Um, he has published his research in very many prestigious journals, including Nature uh, Communications, uh, Environmental Science and Technology, Plus One, Neural Computing and Applications. Um, and he has received many distinguished awards. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Kiagadi for his presentation. And thank you so much for uh, doing this uh, for us, uh, Amin. Thank you, Bridget, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, uh, Hello everyone, my name is Amin Kiagadi and today I'm gonna to talk about compound flooding and its environmental impact. Uh, compound flooding by itself is a new buzzword, even though the, the effect has been with us for many, many years, but you know, more recently it's, 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 it's been a to hot topic, but you know, there, there have been less attention to the environmental impacts of it. So uh, let me think, I need to share my screen with you first. Okay, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, I, wait, wait. Okay, so uh, it is commonly believed that the storm surge is the most costly as or costliest aspect of a hurricane. Uh, for example, Hurricane Ike in 2008, it had a 17.4 feet of storm surge in Galveston Bay and caused almost $37 billion in damage. On the other hand, Hurricane Harvey, in 2017 had only a six feet of storm surge in Corpus Christi, but brought more than 50 inches of rainfall to Houston and Beaumont area and caused $130 billion in damages. So although both of them are in a way compound flooding events, and I will explain them in, in a minute, but you know, since could be worse, basically we could have like a, like a, a storm that has like a bigger surge with like a very big uh, rainfall event at the same time, and that can cause like, you know, way more damages compared to Harvey and Ike. So uh, if you compare the surge based to a rainfall based uh, um, storm, on the left hand side, you see Hurricane Ike, you can see most of the inundation happened. Uh, can, you, can you guys see my uh, uh, mouse or like the, the pointer? Yes, we can. Okay. So you can see the most of the inundation happen here in the coastal zone when, when you have when you're close to the uh, to the water body you have the addix barker addix reservoir filled during ike but you know some 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 inundation and flooding in the white oak are you because of the uh, um, rainfall and uh, but during hurricane harvey you can see almost the entire harris county got flooded including the coastal zones uh, but you know, if you go further to the to the to the land, you can see how much uh, inundation happens in the Cypress, Cypress, in the in the Buffalo Bayou, in the Braze Bayou, and all of the streams uh, um, discharging to the to the Houston Ship Channel. So, but if you focus on the uh, coastal part or the estuarine part, to be more uh, accurate, you can see during Hurricane Ike, most of the inundation happens when to the area closest to the Galveston Bay. And that makes sense, right? Because it was a storm surge and the, the direction of the water was from the Galveston Bay towards the land and then receded back to the Galveston Bay, followed up by a, a rainfall uh, runoff from the uh, White Oak Bayou and the Buffalo Bayou and all other streams. 
during Hurricane Harvey, uh, you see most of inundation here, which is the, the release from the Lake uh, Houston Dam, and here in the western part, which is basically all the bayous uh, emanating from the greater Houston area. You still see some, some level of inundation here in the closer area to the Galveston Bay, but not as much as the Hurricane uh, Ike. So how could it get worse? Uh, so we were lucky during Hurricane Ike because of the, the, the location that it landed. Uh, there, so this is a work uh, basically uh, done in uh, uh, UT Austin by, uh, by uh, Dr. Dawson. Uh, and then you can see that this is the original track of Ike, but they tested different locations. What if Ike was hitting from this point or like doing the, land, the landfall at this point? And then interestingly, this is the Ike uh, as, as, as it was, the original scenario. Then you're looking at arc at 0.7, which is here. If if the track was shifted towards this, and then we we had the hurricane doing the landfall here, you could see how much more inundation you could see in the system. And I need to emphasize that this is combined effect of rainfall and um, storm surge. Uh, and then look at arc 730, which is basically at 0.7 with 30% more powerful wind. And then you can see the entire system is inundated. So we were kind of lucky during Ike, um, but things could get definitely worse. And then imagine that you get something like this with some more rainfall than Ike, and that would be uh, really, really a disaster. So uh, according to the IPCC, uh, compound, compound event in general is an event that two or more extreme events occurring simultaneously or within a short period of time from each other or combination of one extreme event or more than one extreme event with some underlying condition that amplify the impact of events. So imagine a scenario that you have a really extreme rainfall with some high tide in your system. And then when they, with the two of them combine, you will have like an even more extreme event or combination of events that by themselves, they are not extreme, but they can lead to an extreme event. So that in that case, you have like sea level rise, for example. And when that combined with some uh, rainfall that by itself is not big deal, you will see some, some uh, extreme event or some extreme uh, flooding. Or you, you know, this could not be even limited to, to one type of event. Uh, imagine a case that you have a wildlife fire uh, and then followed by a rainfall, and that would cause an extreme, even more extreme flood, and that would be compound flooding. So the most common compound uh, flood is when you have a storm surge and rainfall. And uh, this is Hurricane Ike. Uh, this is the storm surge. You can see we had almost like almost close to five meter of uh, storm surge um, uh, at near Greens Bayou in, within the Houston Ship Channel. And then we also had almost uh, close to uh, 15 or 16 centimeters of rainfall, uh, basically like very within very short period of time from uh, the, the, the peak of the storm surge. So that lead to, to this. The, 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 the black line shows you the Hurricane Ike effect, uh, just the storm surge part, not, the, uh, not including the flow. But when you add the flow, you can see the effect on the peak is not that high because, of course, it, it is a uh, storm surge dominated uh, um, phenomenon. But look at this, your inundation times become longer and then you even have some extra inundation when the uh, runoff is con concentrated and coming from the watersheds to, to your system. So the effect of compound flooding events, uh, I like to categorize uh, the, these events into two, uh, wind, storm surge, high tide, sea level rise, and significant rainfall are the primary hazards and the direct effects are from, uh, the ones that uh, basically coming directly from the hazard, whether you know, uh, uh, damage to, to a structure or to a bridge or to your house. Uh, but we also have the indirect effect that is due to changes in water and sediment quality, uh, to be more specific, from spills and leaks. And that's part of the uh, area that has not been you know, paid attention you know, as much as it, it deserves. So... Uh, today, I will talk a little bit about both of them, uh, and then I, I want to emphasize the coastal resilience, uh, the meaning of it based on, the, based on NOAA. Coastal resilience means building the ability of a community to bounce back after hazardous events such as hurricanes, coastal storms, and flooding 
rather than simply reacting to impacts. So to be able to do this, we really need to model these scenarios and then also be able to predict um, the, it, it, this type of compound flooding events. So we need models for mainly for prediction and also to run scenarios. And on top of that, it, you know, this is a such complex uh, system that is not, it is not easy to understand without the help of the model. So we really need to have a system that can be used for both prediction, which gives us some uh, uh, like heads up when it comes to uh, helping people and then to our first responders, and also to, to run uh, uh, scenarios to, 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 to manage the mitigation plans, to come up with the mitigation plans and to, to be strategic about them. So what types of models are available? The answer is whatever you need is available as long as you know the principles, uh, you can different models, but uh, we have a lot of rainfall runoff hydraulic models like Geisha, HECRAS, HECHMS, HSBF, EFDC, whatever acronym that you want is out there. Um, the storm surge models, Atzerk, Slush, Del3D, Schism, and many more. But the problem is none of them is capable of modeling a compound flood event. Most of these models, if we, I think if you go to the next slide, if you look at this, if you, if you categorize your system to hydrologic system, hydraulic system, restoring systems, and then coastal surge system, there is no single model that is capable of handling all these three systems at the same time. So as a result and as a like natural solution, we are looking to couple different models, whether two models with each other or three models or even more models to each other. But that's the that's the solution here, or at least the, the solution that people are using commonly nowadays is coupling models. So each of these models have a domain that basically could contain one or two systems. Like, you know, this is, could be hydrologic and hydraulic system. Some other models are coastal system and hydraulic systems. And then the way that it works is through their boundary condition, we couple them. There are three different ways to couple models. One way, loose coupling, two way, loose coupling and dynamic coupling. The, most of the things that I show you today is gonna be one way loose coupling. However, I'm going to give you a, like a very simple explanation of each of these methods. In one, one way loose coupling, you run one model, you use the results of that model as the boundary condition of your second model. In the two way loose coupling, you run the first model, use the results in the, as the boundary condition of the second model, you run the second model, and then use the, the results of that as the boundary condition of the first model. You do that a couple of times until to the point that you, you, you converge the results and then you're happy with the level of errors that you get. The, the most effective one, but it's also the most, uh, the costliest one is dynamic coupling in which that you run two or more than two models at the same time. And then they are kind of have, they are providing feedback to each other. So at each time step, your, your coastal model, for example, will provide the, the downstream boundary condition for your hydraulics model. And the hydraulic model at the, at the same boundary condition will provide the flow rate or the flux to your system for your coastal uh, model. So however, it, it's really hard to, um, to do such, such type of modeling. One is because you know, these models are written in different programming languages. Like one of them is Fortran, the other one is C++. The other one is like in synchronizing the um, the uh, the the time step would be really hard, and then you know making sure that the model is stable. So there are a lot of challenges here that I'm not going to talk about them today. So the study area that I will talk about them is like kind of north e northwest of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, basically in uh, um, Texas and uh, Louisiana. Um, the, the two specific modeling effort that I'm going to talk about them, one of them is for Houston Ship Channel, Galveston Bay, Estuarine System, and the other one is for the uh, Nietzsche's and Sabine River uh, right at the border of Texas and Louisiana. So th th this is the first one. Uh, we used uh, EFDC, Environmental Fluid Dynamic Code, with ATSERC or Advanced Circulation Model. So ATSERC was the coastal model, EFTC was the hydraulic, hydrodynamic model, and the EFTC was the primary model. We got the downstream boundary condition from the ATSERC, and for the flow boundary or the upstream boundary, uh, boundary condition, we, we got it from USGS gauges or from the HEC-HMS model. 
So uh, this is the domain of the, uh, the model. You can see almost uh, 15 or 16 different bios and streams are included in this model. Uh, the, it covers the Houston Ship Channel, Galveston Bay system. There is a big history of hurricanes and severe storms, just to give you a heads up. Just from 2000, we had Allison, we had uh, Memorial Day, we had Tax Day, we had Harvey, we had Imelda, uh, and, and counting, I guess. It is highly industrialized, so you can see the, the industrial parcels right along the, the, the system. Uh, the EFTC storm surge or EFTC SS uh, was the blow for this area. You, you're looking at the bathymetry here and the location of the boundary conditions. Uh, it can it considers both uh, surge and the runoff in the model. It doesn't have the you know, rainfall on grid, uh, so uh, it basically but you know the, the location of the flow boundaries are very close to the water body, so kind of counts for the runoff in the system. So the first research question is what is the effect of local runoff on inundation level during a storm surge event. So you're looking at a, a, a difference map. In other words, we run the EFTC model with the uh, boundary condition from AdCERC and SWAN and the, the USGS and HECHMS once with flow and once without flow. Then we subtracted the flow from the, or subtracted the, the no flow from the flow one. And this is the difference map. So right at the surge peak of the hurricane Ike, you can see the majority of the system is at the point that there is not that much of difference in the depths. So even though this shows between one centimeter to 50 centimeters, the, the, most of it is close to two or three centimeters of difference. But you can see a little bit of difference here in the western part and here in the northern part, and that's because of the Lake Houston Dam, the Barkers and Addicts Dam's release, and then some of the tributaries discharging to the system. Uh, so four hours after the storm, uh, the, the surge peak is still kind of the same. And keep that in mind that in, in Houston, it takes between 12 hours to almost five days uh, for the for the watersheds to concentrate the water and then discharge it to the, to the Houston Ship Channel. So one day after that, now you can see the difference in the northern part and the western part, and it's kind of shifting towards the east. So you have some more difference here. But one and a half days uh, uh, after the storm surge, you can see how much of difference. This is more than two meters in difference in a lot of places in your system. And then you can also see some negative value, which is important because the interaction between uh, flow and surge and tide and then the location that are already wet because uh, of the surge are, is not linear. It's not like a superimposed effect that you can say, okay, here I have this amount of water surface elevation from surge. Here is I have from the uh, rainfall. So I'm going to sum them up and that would be the results. So it is important to, to, to notice such a difference. And this is important because Traditionally, most of the storm surge models that we are using, they are not including the flow in their boundaries, uh, and that could cause a huge amount of error in your system. So two and a half days, still high level of uh, difference uh, because the, the watersheds are still discharging to your system. And then one week after the storm surge uh, is basically back to normal because you know all the all the watersheds already discharge it, discharge all the water, and the only difference is in the in the uh, San Jacinto River because the the continuous release from Lake Houston. So when you look at the inundation, uh, this is the total inundation in your system in square kilometers with the no flow scenario. You could see this the surge like a very rapid inundation and a very rapid uh, uh, receding of the water. But when you add the flow, you can see higher inundation, but also some more graduate uh, uh, decline in the uh, or decrease in the inundated area. And this part is not only important for rescue missions and the first responders and damages and direct uh, effects. This is very, very important for indirect effects because you know the, the more this, your system is inundated, the more the chance of uh, getting polluted, uh, spills and leaks, and then it's going to directly affect the fate and transport of the leaks. So just for comparison, this is the inundation during Harvey. You can see it was higher inundation, but it was more graduate, uh, both towards the peak and then more graduate decrease in the system. So Question two, how capable, reliable is ATSERC compared to HECRAS? And this is a big question uh, because 
nowadays uh, there there is like a debate on okay which model should be the primary model uh, when it comes to compound flooding we should which model should be the focus of the the modeling and then we, the, which one should be the the model that provides the boundary condition so uh, this work this time we had abstract model uh, and then we had hecras model if this is a hecras 2d uh, and the, the study area is the niches and sabine river uh, right at the border of texas and louisiana uh, and then uh, for that, we use a very, very large abstract mesh. This is like a 5 million node uh, mesh. We normally use like, like a big chunk of tech um, <laughs> infrastructure when we run uh, the, the model over there. So uh, with the abstract model, this is the bathymetry that you can see. And you can again see how big is this mesh. Uh, it is important to have such a large mesh because then it can capture the the formation of the storm surge and then how it comes to the to the uh, to the land uh, without this mesh you cannot like uh, model that properly so this is the focus or the study area that i'm going to show you you can see still we have some good resolution in the sabine lake in the niches river and the sabine river uh, and this is the hecras boundary condition and uh, domain and the hecras bathymetry and the um it, this one is developed by army corps um and uh, we, we we did this we we did this pro project in collaboration with them and uh, this is the mesh for hecras you can see how fine is this mesh uh, and then this is the abstract mesh we have some good resolution here and here when we have some channels but it's not that good when it comes to some land around the the channels and that could be a source of error for sure we are completely aware of that but this one was just to comparing the, the two models as is. Uh, so this is the input to the uh, HECRAS, to, sorry, to the ATSERC model, the Nietzsche's River Hurricane Harvey and the Nietzsche's Sabine River Hurricane Harvey, both from the HECRAS model. And then we use that, um, if I go back here, uh, at the, as the boundary condition in the uh, ATSERC. So to clarify, we had three models. One is ATSERC model large mesh, the other one is ATSEC model small mesh. We cut the large mesh to just represent the, the niches uh, watershed. And then we have a HECRAS model, the HECRAS 2D model developed by Army Corps. Uh, so if you look at the results, you can see uh, HECRAS did a phenomenal job in mimicking the, the pattern and the values in the compared to observe. And that's because this is an extensive calibration effort. They did a, a great job in calibrating this HECRAS model. Um, they, they looked at like cell by cell, they look at the manning values, they cell by cell, they look at the bathymetry and topography and all of that to make sure that they can repeat that. But if you look at the ATSERC small mesh, it's very close to HECRAS or very close to uh, observation, probably we are like less than 10 to 15% off. And again, uh, keep that in mind that ATSEC was not like re the mesh was not redefined or not, you know not redissolved to to capture a lot of uh, the areas that you know are not included in the in the model. But um, the the one thing that I want to emphasize is like this point, which is the downstream boundary condition of the HECRAS model. That's like a given value or given time series to the HECRAS. But in ATSEC, we have this capability of kind of like model that in a large uh, mesh, not in the small mesh, because we, we also give that uh, down the stream. But I come back to this point because that's a very important point to make. So now the question three is, what is the, so ATSERC showed that is a reliable model when it comes to compound flooding to capture both flow and storm surge effects. So the question three now is, what is the effect of local runoff on inundation level during a rainfall dominated hurricane? Remember on question one, I showed you the effect of local runoff on a surge dominant uh, event. Now it's like on a rainfall dominant event. And then here, uh, um, this left uh, figure, or it's going to be a movie in a second, shows you the Hurricane Harvey storm track uh, with like the arrows shows you the magnitude of the wind. Uh, here you can see the Hurricane Harvey no flow. And then on the bottom, you see Hurricane Harvey flow. Um, and then here. You can see at the beginning uh, when you don't have uh, you know 
you don't have surge or you don't have rainfall these two are all come almost the same here comes harvey and now it's you know coming to niches and sabine and you can see in the no flow you only saw some inundation because of the surge two or three feet of surge but in the in the flow one you can see how much of difference it could make it could be made just by the presence of the flow uh, so when you look at the max elevation this uh, this effect is more obvious i need to e emphasize a point here uh, the max elevation is not a snapshot in time it's just basically the max elevation of each cell each node observed in the entire time of simulation so this inundation never happened in reality this is like you know the worst case scenario for each node individually putting them together but if you compare these two together you can see almost seven meters of difference in the in the niches and sabine river areas compared to no flow and this is super important because again specifically for ad you know people don't include flow in answer and then uh, because they believe that the 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 storm surge is the costliest aspect is the most important aspect of the storm surge but in reality that you know include not including the flow could lead to a big error in your system so now question four is what are the effects of different components of compound flooding um so here look at uh, you're looking at the excuse me you're looking at the mouth of gulf of mexico where the basically is the entrance of the sabine lake to to the gulf of mexico and the, the surge is gonna go come from this side going upstream and then whatever you comes from the niches and sabine river will come and discharge from this point to the gulf of mexico what you're looking at is iran with no wind and no flow in other words just the tide there is no um there is no storm surge there is no runoff in in this model so now let's add the, the flow. And then uh, I want to emphasize like how big of the flow was. You're looking at 160,000 and 270 or 280,000 CFS of flow and look how little that effect was in the, in the at this point, the mouth of Gulf of Mexico. But when you add the wind, you can see how, effect, how, how big of the effect it had on, on that point. And then now, when you add the, the, the wind and the flow at the same time, you can see, again, a little bit of effect at this point. But most of the time, this is not the point that we want to get information or rescue people. We are kind of interested in this point, which is basically the, uh, the area that people, or in, people live or industry uh, exist. So here again, no wind, no flow. And this is the HECRAS downstream boundary condition, by the way. So if you only run HECRAS downstream boundary condition, you cannot, if you only run HECRAS model, you are not capable of capturing such, such event, uh, effect or doing such analysis because that is something that you need to provide to your model. It, it is not possible to look at that. That is the advantage of having a big model like AdCERC. So no wind, no flow. Then you can see uh, no wind with flow. So you can see the effect of flow here is huge. Um, then no wind with no flow, you can see some effect here, some inundation here, and then it goes back. But of course, you cannot capture this. But now if you add the wind and flow and then compare it with no flow, you can see if you just run abstract with, with flow and no wind, you get this one and you miss this part. And this is important. Why it is important? Because this is almost like two or three days that you are going to miss the opportunity to rescue people if you not if you, if you don't consider this you go there you think that it's dry but it's not dry it's, it's flooded so it is important to include the the storm surge in a riverine uh, or in a rainfall dominated uh, storm like hurricane harvey this the storm surge is still playing an important role and that's something that uh, hecras would fail uh, if it comes to prediction mode not in the uh, hindcast mode and then uh, if you don't include this, uh, if you don't include the flow in your ad sec model, then you will come down here and you said, oh, it's safe to go out there. But you look at this, the actual inundation and the actual um, flood is going to happen after that. So this is like from an like, operational point of view, it is very important to, to consider them both uh, and of course accurately. So now question five is how the discharge from one watershed could affect the, the water surface elevation in another watershed. And that's also an interesting uh, question because 
a lot of times we develop models like and as like separate domains. For example, there is a Hecras model for Nietzsche's river. There is another Hecras model for uh, for Sabine River, but one of the discharge from one could directly affect the other one. And that's the, the thing that we're trying to show in these slides. So here, same same set of uh, figures. Here, the top one is Hurricane Harvey niches only. And this is Hurricane Harvey, both niches and Sabine. And now you can see the, the Harvey is coming. Uh, you can see some surge effect. And now look at the effect of the flow. And then this part, this one has the Sabine River included, but this one doesn't have. But that's not the main point that we're going to make. We want to look at the effect of this discharge into the, the into the Nietzsche's River watersheds. Again, uh, looking at the max elevation, you can see, of course, this one has less uh, inundation here because it didn't have this uh, Sabine River. Uh, but this is what I'm talking. Uh, you can see that in the middle of the Sabine Lake, you're looking at the at circ large no flow. So this one is no flow. This one is just niches, and this one is niches and Sabine. So you can see by not including one, you will lose almost half a meter. But when it comes to the, the downstream boundary condition, very similar effect. And this is important, again, for comparing Hecras and Atzerk, because if you're going to go to the prediction mode, you should be able to capture this. If you cannot run Hecras model for just um, Nietzsche's river, by, by not looking at this effect of Sabine River. And this one is interesting in the rainbow bridge here, right in the middle of uh, Nietzsche's watershed, you can see the discharge from the Sabine, how much effect it had on the discharge on the water service elevation in the in the Nietzsche's River. So almost like half or like almost two feet of effect just because of the presence of Sabine River, because the fact that what happened is it's discharging with this angle and it's going to block the water that is coming from the uh, Nietzsche's River and the backwater effect is going to cause some delay in the discharge and it cause in, eventually it's going to uh, increase the water uh, surface elevation in the Nietzsche's watershed. So why and when this interaction could could cause could uh, cause some problems when you're looking at hindcast versus prediction in hindcast you already see that effect in your downstream boundary condition by looking at the observation that observation includes that effect right so when you introduce that to your system you're kind of fine because you know you you already uh, have that effect in your downstream boundary condition but when it comes to prediction you don't have that luxury anymore you, do, you don't know what's going to happen so if you don't include that you will get like almost two feet of error and that two feet could be critical uh, for people to, to get water inside their house or not and for the first responders and also when you run scenarios for future okay do I need to increase the level of uh, my house for two feet or three feet? Uh, what about if I uh, build a new levy in this area? If you don't consider it such compound, I want I like to call this as a compound effect as well because you know the effect of discharging from one watershed could affect the other one. If you don't include that, you will definitely get some errors. So now let's move to the environmental impact or application of these built models. What are the effect of such release on environment and society? Um, so let's let's look at the environmental impact. Uh, severe changes in water quality and sediment transport. This is uh, finally we got the white sand beach in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. This is Buffalo Bayou Park, and you can see how much of sediment de uh, uh, deposition happened here. The leaks and the spills from various sources. I took this picture. This little uh, turtle was trying to escape the the polluted water. Uh, human exposure. We are also uh, could expose to to this uh, to this type of pollutants, and then finally degradation of aquatic life. So the, the list could go on and on and on. I just provided some of the examples here. Uh, give you an example: changes in water quality. Uh, examples of salinity. The salinity range for optimal oyster growth is between 15 to 25 ppt. So you can see this. In, if you're less than 20 to 25, the growth will go down. And if you're more than that, the growth the, will go down as well. So during Hurricane Harvey, uh, the Galveston Bay experienced almost like six weeks, weeks of fresh water, like pure fresh water with the salinity less than 2 ppt. So this is the ATSERC model for salinity. You can see how Harvey, the discharge from different 
bayous cause the, the entire bay become fresh and this part is, will also become fresh in a moment and that situation lasted for almost six weeks and then guess what severely damaging oyster reef we lost almost 98 percent of our uh, oysters in some areas in galveston uh, bay and in the west and east bays uh, during harvey another example is spills and leaks uh, among the natural, all the natural hazards in the U.S. from 1999 to 2008 caused 17,000 hazardous spills. 26% was because of rainfall and 20% was because of hurricanes. So just combined, almost 50% of all the spills are because of the uh, flooding. Uh, and then there are several different sorts of spills and leaks uh, in residential area, rural area, industrial area. Could be landfill, wastewater treatment plant, water treatment plant, super fun sites, and uh, industrial plants. There are different mechanisms for the uh, for for uh, tank failures. It could be like uh, the, the the roof failure or like a debris hitting it or the, the uplifting and it can move and then hit something. And also environmental facilities. This is Hurricane Harvey in Houston. This is Turkey wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and then you can see it was completely inundated and there are some nasty pictures of like uh, the 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 raw sewage uh, you know uh, floating on the water and moving around and then keep that in mind that our children are playing in this water people are exposed to this water um, so we looked in, in a in a collaboration with rice university and the speed center and dr jamie paget's group uh, Dr. Clint Dawson and Dr. Hanadi Rifai and I looked at the probability of failure of different of more than 4,200 tanks along the Houston Ship Channel, and then we we used ATSERC and EFTC to calculate the the water surface elevation, and then we used that as an input to a stochastic model that kind of used a Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo uh, simulation to calculate the probability of failure of each of those tanks. So once we have the probability of failure, this could be used as a like an early warning system for tank failure. Um, and then the, the results would be something like this. We have, you, this is the original water body. This is the inundated area. And these are the probability of failure. And you can see one of the ones that we calculate with the highest probability of failure actually failed during Harvey. And then we use this to calculate the fate and or to, to model the fate and transport of these spills to see where it goes. So this is Hurricane Ike, uh, and you're looking at two hours after a spill. Um, interestingly, the, you know, and then this comes natural when we look at these uh, results, but when you just think about it, you might miss it, that if you have a storm surge and you have a spill, the, the pollution could migrate upstream because the surge is going upstream, right? So normally when the spill happened, we go to the field, we do, we get sam samples downstream of the spill. But in, in case of ARC, you could actually look at upstream as well because that pollutant could, could, could go there. This is six hours, one day. And then by, at the end of one day, almost 90% of the entire mass is already in Galveston Bay and is diluted. There is no, nothing that you can do about it. And then consider that during Ike or during Harvey, at least for a week, the entire channel is closed because it's full of debris and like it's very dangerous to go, go out there. And the priority is for the people's life, right? So if you have a spill, that spill will pretty much will go to the final receptor and there is nothing that you can do with regard to uh, remediation or cleaning up. So the solution would be each of these tanks should have a plan for like what, what if, uh, a release happens and then you know how we can prevent that um, two days and then one week is basically less than one percent of the mass is remain in the system but interestingly almost like uh, uh, 10 I think is 20 ton 29 tons of this spill remain on land and that is important because then you know where you can go to to get samples and also if there is a case that you know there are two or more than two uh, uh, leaks from different sources, you can figure out which one, which area is polluted, but which of those uh, spills. So now let's take a look at Harvey. You can see there is no upstream movement this time, directly towards downstream, six hours, one day. This one is, was even faster. Uh, and then after one week, again, less than 1% uh, of the mass remained on the system. 
but Harvey caused more land uh, pollution compared to Ike. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the area of the land was also uh, bigger compared to, uh, to Ike. So now, like changing the gears a little bit here, uh, I'm not going to focus that much on these slides, but I just want to show how connected these are together. So from compound flooding, we, we went to probability of failure from to the spills and to the like, you know, how the fate and transport of those spills are. Now let's take a look at this. This is Houston Chip Channel or from Buffalo Bayou, Greens Bayou, Carpenter Bayou, Braze Bayou. These are the location that we collected samples from sediment and water. And then the, the triangle, the circles and a rectangle, they are, they are showing the location of the actual spills and leaks during Hurricane Harvey. So here, keep that in mind, we had spill tank, we had the spilled water, wastewater treatment plant, and we had the spilled uh, 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 Superfund site. So now we, we collected heavy metals uh, in sediment and look at that. This area with all these spills has more, way more uh, concentration of the heavy metals in the, in the sediment. Okay, how does uh, that, does that gonna affect us or the ecosystem, right? So let's go to the, to the smallest units. Let's go to the bacteria uh, level. And then you can see for this one, this one, and this one, you can see almost the same pattern in the community of the bacteria. But for this one is completely different. Actually in this one, a lot of common and good bacteria are dead. And there are some like very dangerous and very rare bacteria are living in this sediment in this area because those are the ones that are kind of extremophilic and they like extreme uh, conditions and that they can survive in an area with high level of uh, uh, heavy metals and other toxics. So in a broader picture, you can see in the, in the Galveston Bay area, almost the same pattern. But when it comes to the Houston Ship Channel here again, this is the San Jacinto waste pit. And then you can see this area also has a completely different pattern from the other. This one has a super fun site. These two has a super fun site. The rest are similar. They don't have a super fun site spills, spilled or leaked during Hurricane Harvey. So it's all connected. You cannot look at the coastal resiliency without that. And now let's take a look at the social aspect of it. Who gets affected the most by flooding? Our definition of vulnerable population is based on concentrated disadvantage. It's an indicator of community well-being. Uh, it has five input variables, percent of individual below poverty line, and then all the way to the person less than 18 age, 18 years of old. Uh, you can see in the Harris County, uh, this kind of like a, this like a circular area is like the, the most the, the poorest communities with the least education, with the, with the highest disadvantage uh, uh, concentration. And this is kind of the area with the Houston Ship Channel, same thing. So when it comes to mother nature, it seems that we did the correlation analysis. It seems that the mother nature was fair. It was justice. Uh, we didn't see anything with regard to distribution of the flood or distribution of uh, the rainfall when it comes to uh, concentrated disadvantage. However, we saw this. Most of the spills and most of the or potential for spills or vulnerability of environmental industrial uh, facilities, including Superfund size, wastewater treatment plants, and landfills happen in this area with the highest concentrated disadvantage. This is based on FEMA 100 and FEMA 500. And same thing was true for Harvey and ARC. Look at Harvey. Um, this is the actual spills, not modeled. You can see most of them are here in area with height, uh, and then some here, and this is basically because of the release from the addicts and Barker Reservoir. So it is a very, very complicated and complex challenge. And we at Texas Water Development Board in partnership with USGS and Army Corps uh, hope to address and tackle some of these problems uh, through the Texas Integrated Flooding Framework. Um, it's gonna affect the, uh, it's going to affect the areas uh, that uh, uh, got hit by Hurricane Harvey, but we will probably expand the work to, um, to the, uh, the entire coast of Texas. It's going to be focused on compound flooding. It's going to create an integrated framework for comprehensive flood planning or compound flood planning and mitigation in Hurricane Harvey impacted area. Uh, it's a $3 million project over three years of per, uh, period. It has a, a very firm and hard deadline on June 30th, 2024. 
the, the, the project is a planning project with four components, data and monitoring gap analysis, data management and visualization, integrated flood modeling framework and planning and outreach. In the first one, we are gonna look at all the existing models for the, that can be used for, excuse me, for the compound flooding in the state of Texas. We do a spatial and temporal analysis to see what's missing. And we come up with some suggestions to uh, GLO, to General Land Office, uh, to expect, you know, to, to install new gauges or like, you know, the, increase the frequency of measurement for some of the, uh, for some of the uh, uh, variables that we, we are interested in compound flooding. Also, uh, we will look at the new monitoring uh, technologies, whether there is a new satellite launch by NASA or whatever new sensors that is available, we're gonna look at them. For the data management and visualization, we will focus on compound flooding as a part of TIDIS, basically, Texas Disaster Information System. Uh, we will kind of uh, focus on compound flooding and make sure that you know the needs for, to understand that would be part of the TIDIS. For the modeling framework, we are interested to look at whether one, one model system, two model system, three model system is the best solution for compound flooding. We look at the different techniques to couple models and we will look at the joint probability uh, of, uh, uh, for risk analysis for compound flooding. And finally, in planning and outreach, we are interested in looking at like new ways to evaluating the flood-related projects, especially uh, uh, compound flooding. Uh, ones and then we also want to identify the end users and when I say end user I mean from a normal citizen all the way to a mayor to first responder to senator and then what would be required for each of those uh, uh, end, user, end users when it comes to data and models. So each of these component designs in coordination with technical advisory teams. We have four adv technical advisory teams with a total of almost 90 to 100 people in them. We had our first kickoff meeting in April 5th and some of you might be even part of that technical advisory team, but you know, if you're interested to help us in any, any capability, please feel free to contact us and we will be more than happy to listen to you and then learn from you. The TIF vision is, uh, the focus would be on compound flooding, a facilitated access to compound flooding related information for decision makers at all levels to make it simple to hand the right information to the right people. That's the whole goal here. Um, utilizing quality data, robust models, and the uh, sound science. Uh, this is like a way we really want to collaborate with our partners here uh, and then develop trust relationship among agencies. And then at the end, we want to pr produce or like have a plan to produce a, a reliable coastal compound flooding risk planning. Uh, and then one thing that is super important is avoiding redundancy. There are a lot of redundancy going on at the state level, even at, we, at or oh, at, at our own agency, we have a lot of the, you know, redundancy that we are trying to minimize those. And TIFF would you know, set an example of like how we can reduce them. So how it all comes together, it all, it, all of it is around end users. And for that end users, we will use planning and outreach component to identify them. And then once we identify them, we can use observed data or, or, or see what type of observed data is required. And then the component one will use will be used for that to identify the existing ones to do a gap analysis and then kind of looking at the new uh, monitoring uh, technologies that observed data could be go directly back to the end users for their use or uh, when we have the end uh, the, the needs we, we can go to the component three and, and two and then through two we can have like you know looking at the post-processing tools interactive platforms apps data format data storage and most of them would be done through tidis we will be just there to complement and enhance that uh, and then kind of focus on compound flooding as a kind of new disaster into the system. And then the, that will lead to the process data and that process data will go back to the end users or that observed data will can be used also for calibration validation of the modeling efforts. And then once we have the modeling results that, go, that will go part of the process data or could be directly by, used by the end users. Uh, at the end, I want to thank and I want to introduce actually the steering committee to you from Texas Water Development Board. Kami Shawn Buckler is the manager of coastal science. She's my manager. I'm the official TIF project manager and I'm a coastal flood model at TWDB. 
uh, Michael Lee and Sam Brendan from USGS and Coraggio Malio and Shahid Al Islam from Army Corps Galveston District are the steering committee for this project, which kind of lead the project and kind of oversee uh, the, and and lead the conversations in the in the technical advisory team groups. I want to thank the the, the funding uh, providers like uh, Hari Institute, uh, Speed Center, uh, EPA. Uh, NSF and uh, and Army Corps, of course, and then I want to thank some of the work with ADSERC and HECRAS was done with the support of Army Corps. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to close my presentation and thank you very much for listening and I'm ready to answer any question. Wow, that was an incredible amount of information and uh, excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Amin. Um, sure. uh, really learned a lot from from what you talked about. So there are a number of questions in the uh, chat box and um, uh, I will ask uh, people to um, unmute themselves to ask them. So uh, Dev, do you want to, um, um, uh, do you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, okay. And uh, I mean, this was a really nice talk. Uh, one question I, do have is in your entire plan, you seem to have lots of details on on the ground with the inundation, with the flow, but what about the rainfall? Uh, how, so I didn't see much in the context of how you are looking at the rainfall uncertainty or rainfall input or info, rainfall prediction so I would love to get your thoughts on two parts. One is this question, what is the rainfall uncertainty and what kind of uh, input is required? And second is, this is something we do quite well uh, with the hurricane kind of models. And uh, how can we help you? Those sure. are the two questions. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing about rainfall, you're absolutely right. Uh, not only rainfall can generate runoff, it, the rainfall on grid or like the rainfall on top of water is also super important for us. Considering Hurricane Harvey, um, we had almost 50 inches of rainfall directly fell into Galveston Bay. And then none of the models are considering that. Uh, and so TIFF will definitely want to look at that as well to make sure, because let me tell you something. If you have a model and you calibrate it, you can manipulate today the models in a way that you want to get the results, right? You will, you could mimic uh, Hurricane Harvey down to I don't know six digit decimal points, whatever you want. But if you not, if you're not doing that correctly based on the physics of the problem, the next event would be a failure for your system, right? Because you did not consider the actual physical players in your system. So definitely, rainfall is important. And also on top of that, as you mentioned, the uncertainty in predicting rainfall. Uh, is something that we want to look at it. We want to look at the, 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 the radar, um, how we can convert the radar to then using the grand truth thing and then kind of like make it reliable as an input to the models. And we also want to look at anything that is available out there with, with, that could give us a, a robust rainfall prediction. And th that's the area that machine learning could also play an important role. Uh, because you know that the, the the pattern in the rainfall and then how that is kind of the correlation between rainfall and runoff is not something linear and it's not something that could be easily caught by like physics based model for extreme events. Uh, so because we, during extreme events you have some inter watershed flows, you have some some a lot of factors that normally uh, not a big player during a normal uh, flooding event. So. And then how you can help us for sure, uh, we are open to any suggestions. And then uh, we want to identify the gaps. And once we identify the gaps, uh, the gaps, we will go to the string, uh, to the technical advisory committee, get their input, and then we will come up with some recommendation and final report. And that's where basically we make suggestions to GLO. Okay, there is a need for new uh, models that could capture the uncertainties with regard to the, to the rainfall. And then GLO, GLO kind of told us that they will, they will do their best to make this happen. So they will put aside the money. And then that, I think that's where you can actually go and apply for that to implement that. But in the planning phase, of course, you know, just feel free to contact us if you have anything to, to add it or to, to you know, 
definitely if you're an expert in this field, you can help us to, to identify those gaps better and more efficient. Thanks, uh, Amin. So uh, another question from Alka Tawari. Uh, do you, would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Amin, for this wonderful presentation. However, I had a few questions. First was, I think in the very beginning, the slides that you were showing, where you had done uh, some experiments, so where you were showing the extent of inundation. So had you used like uh, the HECRAS or ADSERC for that, or how had you ob obtained those uh, inundation uh, figures? Uh, it, let me it, see. You know, started your presentation. You, you're talking about the beginning of the presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in fact, before question one even. Oh, okay. Yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this. Yeah, no, this no, after after this, the three scenarios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the three scenarios. This one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, th this is a couple, the one way loose coupling of EFTC environmental fluid dynamic code with the ATSERC and SWAN model. So it okay. gets the downstream boundary condition from the ATSERC SWAN and then it gets the, the, uh, the upstream boundary condition from HEC, HEC HMS and the USGS gauges. Okay. Um, I also had one question. Um, sure. It's regarding if I'm only considering. Uh, in terms of the issuing the warning or the warning system, how critical it is to go to the level of hydraulic modeling and not just issue the warnings through the hydrologic uh, simulations or uh, you know results that you are getting. Is it like very critical, especially in this um, hurricane kind of scenario? Because uh, uh, my thinking is that probably just from the stream flow or their parameters it will be identifiable that this is crossing some limit and we should issue the warning. Or so so the, you're, you're talking about the like a warning, like a fuse, uh, like, you know, for, for like people, for if mm -hmm. evac, okay. Yeah. Uh, so for that, you definitely need to do, consider the hydraulic and the, the storm surge aspect of it, or at the bare minimum, the tide aspect of it, because hydrologic models is just kind of giving you a time series of the flow and the water surface elevation, maybe at the output, out, out, you know, the, the output of the watershed. But if you don't, if you don't put that in the context of like the tide and the, the dynamic between the the flow and the the surge and the tide coming from the um, from the coastal part, then you you will and you might end up some. Um, I wouldn't say like. Uh, Let's put it this way. If you only consider hydrologic models, you will exclude some parts that might be affected by the effect, effect of both of them. Okay. And uh, if, it, if I'm only concentrating on inland flooding and not the coastal part of the, it, due to hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So according to your experiences, uh, whatever models you have looked into, which model do you think performs better or has you know, better calibration techniques uh, for the inland flooding in hurricane scenarios? You know, that's a very loaded question. And that's part of the, our evaluation during TIF. Uh, so my answer is not a reflection of TIF here or a reflection of my position at TWDB. It's just my personal opinion. Uh, I think if you go looking at just purely inland, maybe HECRAS 2D at this point would be the best. Okay. Um, one more, the last one. Sure. Uh, in, in the hurricane scenarios, which parameter of the hydrograph is critical to analyze the peak magnitude, time of peak, or, you know, the, the, the time of that recession lean, like, uh, or, or anything else, which parameter do you think? in, in it, it, it really depends on application. Uh, so for example, if you're looking at those tank failure or like anything environmental or ecological, then uh, the, the, the time of that thing, the, the timing of that phenomenon related to the, uh, the, 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 the time series or the, the hydrograph is critical as well. But I would say all of them because uh, the, the peak will show you kind of like where it's going to be affected the most. Uh, the, the duration and the, the time, time aspect of it also show you the, the, the window of opportunity for you for rescue or a window of exposure. So I would say all of them. You need to consider all of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Amin. So, uh, Alex, Alex Sun, would you like to ask your questions? Yeah, uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. So, uh, my, my first question is kind of like, a, I mean, probably pretty silly. 
Uh, so, so in my mind, like uh, hurricane or uh, in, in the Gulf area are kind of always accompanied with a uh, heavy rainfall. So in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, is, is it possible that you have like a high surge uh, without a uh, uh, high discharge from the land? Uh, so, so that's the first question. And the second one is related to uh, the uh, tank uh, tax bill uh, risk assessment work you talk about. And so my question was mainly related to, uh, you know, whether the information uh, is in the public domain and, you know, how, how you did uh, the uh, risk assessment. All right, thanks. Thank you. Actually, your first question is, is a fantastic, amazing question. Uh, the, there are some studies to look at the joint probability of storm surge and rainfall. Uh, the short answer is it is not possible to have Harvey and Ike at the same time. It is not possible, right? However, it is possible to have something that is slightly smaller than Harvey and something that is slightly uh, smaller than Ike happening at the same time or within a very short period of time from each other. So. Um, that's something that is a very, very hot topic, and TIFF want to tackle that to, to calculate that joint probability on basically, in other words, if I have a storm surge of 10 feet, what is the probability of having another 10 inches of rainfall accompanied that, right? So that's a big question. And right now, FEMA is using a superimposed uh, linear approach, which is uh, you know, obviously has a lot of flaws and a lot of issues with it right now, but that's the best that we have right now. Uh, so th this is something that definitely needs a lot of more research. And this is part of uh, the job that TIFF will probably want to rely on uh, academia as well. We will, you know, at some point we might even uh, release some RFQs or RFPs or, you know, go directly to some um, faculties that we know that they are, you know, they are expert of this job. Uh, so this is like a very important topic that you brought up. For the second one, uh, you know, it is public and it's not public. Uh, when <laughs> it's come to academia, you know how it works, right? You, you claim in your paper that everything is available, but that link doesn't work. Or, you know, uh, it's, it's impossible that, that the, the PI never respond to your email to, to get back to you, to, to give you. If, you. if you tell him or her that, hey, I have $50,000, you know, within three seconds, you get reply. But if you say, I want this data, that would take three decades to get a reply. <laughs> so <laughs> I would say uh, the, the, the person who has this data, all the 4,200 uh, the tanks with the heights of them, with the diameter, with what actually inside those is Jamie Paget at Rice. Uh, so, you know, I really don't know uh, if, if she's willing to share or not, but that's the point of contact. Um, All right. I don't think, I think I, I um, got, uh, let me just check. Uh, I think I got all of the um, questions and um, I really appreciate uh, your time, Amin, sure. and I would encourage uh, the uh, listeners to uh, read Amin's papers. He's published a number of uh, very important papers uh, to get more familiar with his work, and uh, you can contact him by email or phone, and uh, uh, we look forward uh, to talking with you some more in the future, Amin, and thanks again for an uh, incredible presentation. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, bye-bye.